Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host. Uh, I'm John DeLynn. It is March 4th, 2019, and we are in part two of my interview with my mom, uh, Nan Parkinson DeLynn McCulloch, we'll call her for the purposes of the interview. Um, in part one of this interview, uh, which we live streamed, we talked about uh, her, her parents, her ancestors, uh, uh, briefly about her mom growing up as the daughter of a polygamous family. We talked about mom's upbringing in Preston and Franklin, Idaho. Um, she attended Preston High School. She was a cheerleader there. Her love of road shows. Um, and uh, her epic engagement to Delisle Condi that was ended by my father, David Delin, um, as he snuck in and stole my mom away from Delisle. And that's where we ended uh, the last episode. We're grateful for everyone who joined us for part one. Uh, Mom, welcome back to part two. Thank you. It's good to have you. So um, so last we left off, uh, you got married. And we're not going to be sort of doing, you know, the purpose of, of this interview isn't so much to tell your whole life story, but to talk about, uh, you know, a combination of kind of your evolution in the church and your feelings about the church and then... Uh, kind of for my listeners who are interested in a bit about my life, kind of the church in my life and your reflections on, on me. So during this interview, during this segment, we'll be getting into her faith, my mom's faith journey, uh, how the divorce impacted that. We'll be talking about my upbringing and her reflections on that as it related to the church. And we'll be getting into my mom's spiritual evolution, her reflections on my podcast, her reflections on my excommunication, um, interestingly, my mom, uh, was a subscriber to Sunstone and Dialogue long before I knew really about those publications. And, uh, we'll also talk about her beliefs now, cause she still is a believer of sorts and her reflections on death. Recently, her husband passed away and my sister passed away. And so we'll be talking about that as well. So we've got a lot to cover. Um, so, Mom, when you married Dad back around, I think we established it was 1955, something like that, um, uh, what what was the role of the church in your early years in the marriage? Same as it had always been. So just, you know, active in the church. Mm -hmm. Did you have goals? Did you want to be a Relief Society president? No, I never had goals in the church. Why not? I never coveted any jobs. I only wanted to do music, and that's what I did. I was lucky. I got to do music. So from those early years, what were your callings that you usually had? Well, um, I taught Relief Society, and uh, um, twice I was asked to be the president of the Relief Society, but we moved. We moved frequently, like every year. <laughs> And uh, so I, I was asked to be the president of Relief Society twice, but I, I moved and didn't actually get, do, get to do it. Which so I, you've never been a Relief Society president? No. Do you feel bad about that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Why weren't you ambitious in terms of like church callings and stuff? I just wasn't. Uh, I liked, I, I taught Relief Society. I thought that was, I enjoyed that. Okay. So what were the main callings you had over the years in the church? Just music. and uh, What are some of the music callings you had? <laughs> um, leading the singing. Um, like like Chorister? Yeah. One, one ward, I, I established a, a, a music period uh, where I, I did creative things regarding music that tied in with with what you know what we were, what we were doing what the music was and um told about this who wrote the songs and what you know it, that was in in Sunday school so it was kind of a in one ward in California it was kind of a big part of the opening exercises of Sunday school is this, this presentation that I would do on the history of the hymns and and stuff so you, I remember you being a ward, a choir director, the chorister, play the, play the organ, play the organ, piano, and everything. Were those the major callings you had? Yeah. Um, every, <laughs> did you ever play piano in the primary? Yes. 
because <laughs> I remember that because I used to look down and you would be watching me. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember, um, I, I shouldn't bring this up now, but, but I remember how uh, bad I felt when, uh, when the divorce happened. Let's get. Let's wait oh, for that. Okay. I'll, I'll, right. I'll come back to that. Yeah, remind remind. I will me. definitely do. Yeah. That. Okay. Um, I remember you directing road shows and yeah. even yeah. directing musicals. What were some of the musicals? Well, in the uh, in the stakes that you would produce in, well, in the road I, shows. I just I did I just did talent shows that I had a theme and and uh, you know. Uh, 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 what do you call it? A um, thing that tied it all together, and uh, ver various musical numbers and and various, you know, dancing, singing. They they were quite. They were like a road show, <laughs> only a glorified road show. The show I I was always putting on special musical programs in the ward and the stake. Any what what are the musicals that you remember directing for the church or for your stakes? Oh, um, in Boise it was. Um, what are the remember. ones you do remember? Well, I don't. Remember. I remember the Fantastics. Yeah, but that was just uh, something I wanted to do. I started doing that as an assignment in Relief Society to have a special program, really special program, for the sisters. <laughs> and so I did the Fantastics. So I, I, I kind of did more than I was asked to do. But the Fantastics is a legit Broadway musical. Yeah, I know, but they And didn't. you produced it for the stake in Dallas, right? Actually, I did it for the ward. Okay. It was just the Ward Relief Society. But it was kind of a big deal, right? It was a big deal. It turned yeah. out to be a big deal. We had tickets and everything. Yeah, it was... I, I kind of over... Did my callings? Yeah, when when music was involved, I remember you also doing a road show called Acorns, Oaks, and Small Town Folks. Do you remember that one? Yeah, mm -hmm. that was written by one of Gina's uh, Julie's Gina's boyfriends, and and uh, we worked it in one of our programs, and it it was a play. It was a play. We t put it to music and dance. And I remember them singing. Uh, Karen Carpenter song, so it had to have had music in it. Yeah, not just a play. Yeah, they were singing too. But to. most everything that I took on was turned out to be a big, like, <laughs> Ten Commandments. <laughs> you know, I started out doing a road show, and it ended up being the Ten Commandments. You know, it was it was just I I just overdid it, kind of. Okay, so um. So you you and Dad had four children: mm -hmm. Gina, Julie, Joel, and me. I was the youngest. Um, what, what were Dad's professions or careers, and what main cities did you? Yeah, he move? he moved a lot. I mean, it was it was our life was just from one move to another. And uh, what were he, his main career progressions? Uh, they were in law enforcement. Uh, so he started out as what? Well, um, California Highway Patrol. So he was on chips, California Highway Patrol. Yeah, and uh, uh, then we moved from California. You guys moved to Salt Lake, right? Ogden. Ogden, and he was the chief of police in Ogden, right. South South Ogden. Okay. The terrace. Uh huh. And then we moved eventually to Idaho. What was he there? That's where I was born. He was with the uh, uh, um, one of the grant in aids for, with the Department of Defense or Department of Safety in in Idaho. Yeah, yeah. Around like seatbelt and driver safety and yeah. and yeah. car accidents, trying to minimize. Yeah, he was he was in the the safety business, automobile safety business. And then He'll we moved to, to San, like the San Francisco Bay Area, right? Yeah, San Francisco. Uh -huh. What was he doing there? Do you remember? Same thing, L E L E A A. Safety kind of stuff, car safety, highway safety. Yeah. As a bureaucrat now, right? Where he was going to DC a lot. Yeah, he. I think he went as far as he could go, as a 
as a bureaucrat type, and he, he would have had to have been a, an of, official. You know, if we had moved the last time that he planned to move, would would have put us in with the politicians, you know. <laughs> right, and eventually we moved to Dallas, and some my five, you know, after those first two years in Boise and California, five years of my life were in Dallas. And again, he was working with the federal government in like the Nixon and Ford administrations, right? Mm, um, uh-huh. On a federal level. So he kind of went from a yeah. policeman to police officer to state level state, safety state to then federal level law safety, enforcement. law enforcement. Yeah. Law enforcement assistance administration. He went doing the grant and aids where he was administering the money for the mm. in various agencies. So were you happy as a Mormon housewife? I never remember you working outside the home. You were pretty much a stay-at-home mom. Is that fair to say? Yeah. And did you enjoy that? Did you not enjoy it? Yeah, I it? do. I like I like being a mom and a wife. Mm-hmm. I did. I enjoyed it. And, uh, um, but I enjoyed it because I, I got to do my productions. <laughs> I was out of production going. <laughs> so you're saying your your callings in the church around music yeah. helped you feel a sense of meaning and fulfillment and purpose. Right. It it put the, the icing on the cake because everyone knew that their main job in life was being a wife and mother. Everyone knew that. That was just obvious. And so I was content with that. But I was lucky because I got to put on shows all the time. I had a show going all the time. Always had a show going. Every ward I ever went to, I put on plays, musicals, and and I had stuff going, entertaining. You know, I I I don't ever remember not doing that. That was my life. Um. Really quickly, I have to ask you about some historical moments. So, okay. like, what do you think of the civil rights movement with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and well, Bobby Kennedy and all that stuff in the 60s? I didn't uh, think anything about it until we got black friends. And then when we moved... Um, and that was Corny, Corny Cooper in, in, in uh, San Francisco Eunice. Bay Area? Uh-huh. You were in, We were in Foster City, right? Yeah. Foster City, California. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and Dad's boss was was African-American. Right, right. And that made you start thinking about the civil rights movement? Yeah, it did because they talked about it. They ma- they marched with Martin Luther King. They were with him, personal friends. And and uh, and it made me think about it strongly. And I I it was my first experience with black people and it made a, such a good impression on me. I just I mean, they were our best friends when we were in Foster City, and um, I, and we also lived in an integrated neighborhood, which made it very good for the children, and uh, it was, it was just a way of life for us that was, that was unlike any life it, it would have been if I had just done what most people do. But because of, of uh, the business that Dave was in, um, it, suddenly I, I was thrust into a, a new environment. And um, I liked it. I felt comfortable. And uh, um, I felt good about it. So it, Dad was in the Republican kind of Republican Party, Republican administrations, because he worked for Nixon and Ford. What did you think about John F. Kennedy and LBJ as presidents, given that you and your husband were Republicans? Well, I mean, I was political. I was conservative politically. So um, So did you hate Kennedy and hate no, I didn't LBJ? Hate, I didn't hate him. Okay. I didn't hate him. I liked him. And uh, I, I, I was pretty open about uh, programs and things that I liked. I wasn't so political that I was blinded to the obvious. And uh, I, I, uh, I always went with the conservative view on everything. That's okay. just the way I was raised, and that's the way I, I am now. Sure. I still go. 
So when, um, <clears throat> what was it like to see your cousin, Ezra Tap Benson, chosen as, we're going back in time a little bit, yeah. as Secretary of Agriculture for, yeah. for uh, Eisenhower? Yeah, I was proud of that. Was he like the pride of Preston and Franklin? I think so. The church, I think the the church was proud that he was the you know I think it made the church look good. I think he made the church look good. Um, when he in the '60s started getting into the John Birch Society and and becoming all that anti-communist rhetoric and mm -hmm. even that anti-Martin Luther King rhetoric. Did you hear any of that? Yeah, and I, I didn't buy that. I didn't, I didn't go for that. Well, he's your cousin. Well, doesn't mean I have to take his politics. <laughs> no, I didn't go with the Birch Society. I, I didn't buy it. Were you, were you embarrassed by him when he was doing that stuff? Or? No, no, I just figured that's, that's him. That's, him, and okay. that's what he wants to do. It's not for me, but so I couldn't support that kind of stuff. But So, <clears throat> so... Both Ezra Tapp Benson and others kind of were against the civil rights movement. They, you know, Ezra Tapp Benson thought Martin Luther King Jr. was a communist. He wrote books against the civil rights movement. And of course, right. the church had a lot of racist rhetoric. Right. So once, yeah, I, I know you said in the last interview, you didn't think much about black people or people of color because in, in Idaho, there weren't any. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you didn't meet any in college until mm -hmm. you married my dad and you went to California. Yeah. But once you met Courtney Cooper and were, and were sympathetic to the civil rights movement, but then your own cousin, Ezra Tapp Benson, was doing all this anti-Martin Luther King rhetoric and the church was keeping the priesthood from blacks, did you have any conflict about no, that? No, I didn't because I didn't. I mean, I, I liked my cousin, <clears throat> but we weren't that close and, and it didn't influence me in any way. His, no, but the church's stance on blacks by the 60s was a real I, sore thumb. But I didn't buy it. What do you mean? I didn't. I didn't go along with it. With what church? But you still believed in the church, and you I knew believed in the church. But I didn't believe in the political. Uh, that's as political as I've ever seen the church. Okay. I've never seen it political like that, and it was new to me. And so it wasn't like we had a history of it. Just suddenly, it was just some. It was more like a local issue to me. Uh, uh, the impact of it. I, I got the impact of, of it from our black friends, and uh, and I felt deeply about it because of them. Right. But um, I will. I wasn't converted <laughs> as far as to the church's political views around the right. civil rights movement. Right. But what about feeling conflicted about the the ban on priesthood for for African? Oh, I always felt sorrow. I, I so Corny Cooper's your dad's, your husband's best yeah. friend, and you know the church denies yeah. the priesthood. And I always felt sorrowful. What do you that. mean? I just felt bad. I just felt bad. It didn't seem right. But I, it hadn't been that long. It just had been a few years before the ban was lifted. Well, no. I mean, in the 60s, that's when you knew Corny. No, I guess you're right. I guess... Oh, you're right. You were mm -hmm. we were in Foster City by the mid seventies, and so uh, you wouldn't have had to really think about that for only a few years before yeah, seventy eight. It, it, it was. It seemed like just a few maybe years, maybe four or five years earlier. And, but still, it, it it was impactful because of our friends, and uh, <clears throat> and by that time, I was I was very, I was very um, sensitive. To, did it ever make you doubt the church's truthfulness? No, no, I didn't. I just thought it was it was the times. It was we're in the, this period of time, and and this is the way it is right now. In historically, this is the way it's coming down, and I just accepted it as history. You didn't think why is the church so racist or anything like that? No, uh, -uh. why not? I don't know. But you, it made you sad. Made me sad, and I didn't think it was right. But I didn't, you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't. It was I didn't make it my business to go against the church. Whatever they they decided, I I was able to accept, even though I didn't agree with it. What did you think about the Equal Rights Amendment as it emerged in the seventies and feminism? 
I know you were a tennis player and Billie Jean King was an early hero of yours. Eventually she comes out as lesbian and fights for the equal rights movement or equal rights amendment. What did you think about all that when you were a Mormon housewife in the seventies? It didn't affect me. Did you think about it? I thought about it, but I thought this, these, these are the times and this is what's going on right now. And, and I, I can deal with it. Did you support the ERA? Did you want the Equal, Equal Rights Amendment to pass? Did you even care about it? Yes, yes, I did. But uh, I was in, there, there was some reason that I was out of the loop in that particular time. Because I remember uh, finding out from my friends in Dallas that they, they took a bus and they marched against the ERA. Because the church opposed I, it. And uh huh, and I wasn't a part of it because of something that went on in my life. So I don't know if I had a had a baby or something, but I was out of the loop. I think it would have been barter systems and dad and <clears throat> just I, he was working well, a lot. But I was out of the loop on that because I remember when I went to Dallas, hearing the sisters there talking about um, about going taking a bus and and going to. Um, DC. Yeah. So, d so do you don't remember whether you were for or against the ERA, for or against equal rights for women? Well, I was I was for equal rights, but it's just I didn't get into it politically. Okay. I didn't march or tear, carry placards or anything. I didn't do anything. What did you think about feminism at the time? Well, I never was a feminist. I'm still not a feminist. Okay. So. Now, that's interesting because most people nowadays define feminism as just believing that men and women should have equal rights. Oh, and I, and I didn't think of it that way. I defined it as, as being radical. Meaning what? Being kind of obnoxious about it. <laughs> so you... Believed in equal rights, but associated feminism with being radical, so you'd never identified as a feminist. Yeah. No, I have even to this day. You still don't? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, what did the church mean to our family, let's just say up through before the divorce happened? Do you remember dad being devout in the church? Do you remember yes. us? Yes, so he was. Dad was devout? Yeah, but he 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 got so... he. Uh, um, something that he was doing in some job was keeping him from from doing as much as he'd done in the probably past. the um, reserve duty that he had to have, where he would go uh, Coast Guard Reserve. He would, and he traveled a lot when he worked for the federal government. So right. I, I'm guessing between his travels to D.C. and his Coast Guard Reserve duties once a month probably didn't allow him to have some of the callings that he might have had. Right. Is that fair to say? Well, it, it might have been, um, made a small, in a small part. Do you remember us having family prayer? It seemed like we all, we pretty much always had family prayer. What about scripture study? We, we would do it and we would have family home evening one time and then we were going to do it every single week, but then we never did. <laughs> and then we'd do it again after a long time would pass by. And, and we kept the minutes. I've even <laughs> caught the minutes of some of our our uh, our family home evenings. You know, we had, we had a program, and we had this, and we had guests over and various things. And uh, But it was, it was sporadic. It wasn't... On a regular basis. I remember us buying those illustrated Book of Mormon and illustrated New Testament books that would tell all the stories of the scriptures. And we would read that as a family. And that was a way that we would study the scriptures. And we would pass the books around as everybody read from the pages of those illustrated. Do you remember, do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And we'd probably fight and yell at each other and <laughs> misbehave too, right? As kids. It seemed like my kids always wanted family home evening, though. They always, you know, if we didn't have it, why, why aren't we having it, or when can we have it, or <laughs> they, they enjoyed it.
Would you say we had an Orthodox upbringing? Sort of. How how was it? Yes, and how was it? No. We went to church all the time. Okay. We went to we were we were a hundred percenters with our attendance. Okay. <laughs> we didn't read our scriptures, but we went to church. Okay. Um, what about like? Did you pay tithing? Yeah. Did you and Dad go to the temple regularly? Not regularly, but we went. I mean, okay. in Texas, the closest temple for most of my growing up was in Mesa, Arizona. Yeah. So there's no way to go to the temple. Yeah. Do you Do you remember liking the temple? Um, I didn't like it that much. Do you remember why? Because I thought it was odd, and I and I I, I didn't get the I I got the symbol symbolism, but I I'm not a symbolic person, and. Uh, <clears throat> When when they made the changes recently, they, those were changes that I I thought should have been made twenty years ago. So you didn't like the women being a second class citizens? Did no. that bother you? Yes. And the blood oaths and all the Masonic yeah. stuff. Yeah. Did that bother you? Yeah, and uh, and I twenty five years ago or twenty years ago, I used to say. That I you'd say what express that that those are things I didn't feel comfortable with. Yeah, I just never remember you liking the temple. I never remember you wanting to go. You didn't ever. It didn't ever occur to me that you would doubt it or not believe the church is true. But you just weren't a big fan. Were you a fan of wearing garments? <laughs> not really. I mean, I remember you wearing garments for most of my upbringing, but. Why did you say you weren't a fan of them? Well, it was inconvenient and, and you know, limiting. <laughs> limiting? How did they limit you? Well, it, it limits what you wear. Yeah. Um, right. Um, so in those years prior to the divorce, was your was your testimony pretty traditional? Yeah, I think so. I think I always had a really strong testimony. I, I think I could I could say that. Without hesitation, that I was, I had I had a strong testimony, but it wasn't based on constant scripture reading. I, we prayed, I prayed every night, so I always prayed, even if we didn't pray together. But usually, we had family prayer. You did personal personal prayer. And... Yeah, I prayed. I always prayed. And um, what was your relationship with your heavenly Father like? I felt he he was there for me. What are you feeling right now? I think he still is. <laughs> so you were able to talk to him? Did he give you direction? How was he there for you? I, I felt like he loved me. You still do? How did you feel about Jesus and the Savior? What did, he, what did Jesus mean to you? I, I was always confused. Because they talked about Jesus, Jesus, God, and uh, Holy Ghost. Well, no, not not that that didn't bother me that much, but I, I didn't think of Jesus as God. I thought there was God, and there was Jesus. Okay, and, and I didn't think of it like, like uh, a lot of people do. That Jesus wasn't divine? Is that what you mean? No, I, I felt he was he was the savior of the world, but I didn't feel he was God. Like on the status of God? Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Um, so prior to the divorce, did you have any knowledge about problems with the church's truth claims? Did you have any doubts about the church's truthfulness? 
Was that something that even crossed your mind prior to the divorce? Uh, I don't think I thought about it at that time. So you didn't have like an intellectual Mormon life early on? No, but I, I tried to, to keep him, stay informed. And I read the material coming out. And, uh, but I didn't feel like a, like, like, you know, I didn't feel strongly that I had to change anything or, or that I needed to march. Yeah. You know. When the, when the priesthood ban was lifted on, on African Americans, how'd you feel? I was ecstatic. Do you remember where you were when you heard? Yes, I was in Dallas. Actually, we were in Houston in 78. Or Houston. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was in Houston. I remember the house, but I couldn't remember where it was. Yeah. <clears throat> and I was ecstatic, and I was thankful, and I was so, so happy. It meant a lot. It meant a lot. Did it ever bug you that it took the church so long? I mean, yeah. the civil rights movement was in 64, mm-hmm. And this was 14 years after the civil right, rights movement. Right, right. Did that bug you? It seemed like it, yeah. It seemed like it took an awful long time. But it never caused you to doubt or question? No, because I just thought the Lord's in charge and he'll, when the time comes, he'll, he'll see that it happens. Right. Okay. Um, so I think. What, what did your what was your dream life for you and dad? What did like you you guys were married twenty five years, twenty seven years, so. twenty seven years. How did you see? How did you want your life with dad to play out? Well, um, <clears throat> I I I didn't. I don't know. I come from a family that just we do what. What needs to be done, and 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 so that's that's what we do, and when we do it, <laughs> and and so I I would say that that I'm a creature of of habit in a way, and and that and I do I try to do the right thing. Did you have gospel related goals for? For me and Joe and Julie and Gina, did you, did, were the things you want, you know, in the, in the basic Mormon trajectory, what were your hopes for your kids well, church-wise? I, I mean, for the boys, of course, to go on a mission. You want us to go on missions? Uh-huh. Now, dad didn't serve a mission. I know. And your dad didn't. Well, did, he. Your he, dad did serve a mission. Yeah. My dad didn't. Yeah. Okay. You wanted me and Joe to serve a mission. What about, you know, Ju- Julie and Gina? Well, I, 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 I wasn't, I, girl, it wasn't that common for girls to go on a mission. It was uncommon. What about marriage? Oh, well, I wanted them to marry in the church, of course. In the temple? In the temple. All, all four of us? Yeah, I wanted every, yeah, you bet. I'll get temple married. Uh-huh. Okay, and did you want Julie and Jeannie to graduate from college? I was kind of torn. Because of my my upbringing, my I remember my father saying two years is enough for girls. <laughs> I remember him saying that, and uh, and so I I think um, I rubbed off on me a little bit, but I I did want him to get to go to college. I didn't have any set years amount of years for them to go, but I definitely wanted them to go go to college. And that's interesting because your mom did four years of college and she was really proud about that. You only did two. And so you would wonder how you would teach, what you would teach your daughters. Yeah. And I got the sense that Julie and Gina weren't really taught to get your degree. They were just, it sounds like what happened to you was passed yeah. on to Julie and Gina, which is just go to college long enough to find a man and then yeah. get I married. I think that was the Mormon, um, that was the Mormon way. The women didn't need to get the four two, years. Two years is enough for girls. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's talk about the divorce because that probably, that's not the Mormon way. And that's probably yeah. not what you were planning. So right. hey, what do you want to say about that? Um, it was a shock, but even though it was a shock, I was, 
I felt like it was my fault because I I just felt like um, I just I just I just fell down and I felt like I didn't show my husband enough affection and, and so forth and it was my fault. So did you want the divorce? Did you request it? No. No, I didn't. I would not have have had a divorce under any circumstance. So what would you how would you without going into too much detail, how would you describe what happened? Well, how why did you get a divorce? Well, because Dave found somebody else. Okay. I mean, Right. That was. What was that like for you? You had given yeah, twenty-seven years to him. Yeah. Well, to the I, kids. I, I felt guilty. I felt like it was my fault, and I. Um, Do you still feel that way? No, I. I feel like that I played a part in it, though. What would you say happened to the marriage? What happened to your relationship? Well, um, I think work took Dave away, and he would stay and work long hours, and. Uh, his life was his work. He put everything into his life, and trying to be a provider, right? Yeah, but he 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 never felt. He always criticized me that I didn't do. I wasn't as affectionate as he'd like, and he would like me to do this and say this and do this. And Enter- entertain socially, I think that was a part of it. Well, right? that was yeah, that was, but that wasn't a critical point for the divorce. the The divorce was just that I wasn't giving him the affection that he, that he wanted. And how did that did you how did that make you feel? I felt bad. Did you believe that that was your fault then? I I guess so because I felt guilty about it. Hmm. I mean, um uh, how how close were you as friends? How how well did you get along? I think that I think that was the part of it. We weren't um, we weren't closest friends. Why not? I don't know. Personality. We didn't know each other. We 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 got married because I thought it was time I get married. And I I don't think we knew each other. But but in twenty seven years you you think you'd get to know each other. But it sounds like you. Yeah, never... but that, I'm just saying the initial. But I mean, over time, that friendship didn't develop. Why not? <clears throat> I don't know. Are you just saying you weren't a good fit personality-wise yeah, for each I think other? So. Well, how would you describe his personality versus yours as it entered into the marriage and caused conflict? Well, I, I was more conservative, In and what he way? was more in, uh, not politically. What do you mean? Uh, just the way I operated, and and he he was he was more spontaneous. So you were kind of more. Cautious or mm-hmm. planned or methodical. Yeah, and he used to he used to change jobs like every year. And what was that like for you? That was very uh, unnerving for me because I, I, w- I was always worried. About you know, what? Well, is is this going to work? We the last job was the perfect job, and it wasn't the, the perfect job. So it seemed like. He was searching for the perfect job, and um, and kept trying new jobs, and and it worried me. And it probably stressed so you felt, out. All those moves probably I, I, stressed you I out. I felt insecure, very insecure. And uh, I mean, I, I was able to deal with the moves because I always had friends and I always had a good time. But we we enjoyed every place we lived. We had nice homes. We had, we had a good life, and uh, but I, I just felt insecure and and uh, a certain amount of anxiety because of the job changes, frequent job changes. What was your communication style with that? What were your What was your communication style with each other? Oh, I think I think we saved it up. We didn't talk about things. You didn't talk openly? No. Why not? I don't know. I don't know why. So if you had concerns or problems? He would he would come come home from work really tired and, and lie down on the couch and just go to sleep there. So there wasn't a lot of Mm-mm. emotional intimacy between you? Mm-mm. 
How was that after 10, 15, 20 years? That was hard. Were you lonely? I think we both were, yeah. yeah. What was your, uh, how did you handle conflict, you and Dad? Um, I don't know. Did you guys fight? I don't think we fought that much, but we we did some. But um, I don't I don't think we fought a lot. I think we just didn't. We just kept on keeping on. Kind of. It sounds like just this pioneer spirit, where you stayed home and raised the kids, and he earned the money. Mm-hmm. Very patriarchal. Not. You know, and that's probably the way it was back in the day. You just very yeah. duty oriented. Uh huh. But we had we had great experiences. We we got to travel with his job, and um, so it was a good life. I I did never have any complaints about my life. You didn't. Mm-mm. Okay. I was happy with my life. You were happy. Well, so, yeah. You said well. So what was the well? Well, I, I would have liked a, a steadier life, not as impulsive, not as but right. I had a good life. Right. And I just think of Dad as not graduated from college. He tried to go to college several times. Once the kids came, he, you know, he thought about law school, he thought about dentistry. But he was just never able to kind of finish that degree. Mm-hmm. And he was always trying to provide for the family and serve in the church. Yeah, yeah. And you were having mm-hmm. kids quickly. Mm-hmm. And for a guy, who kid whose dad literally was a ditch digger, like he starts out as a cop and he doesn't want to stay there and he's ambitious. Yeah. So he did really well for himself yeah, he, career-wise. He went as far as he could go in his field. Yeah. You know, he, his law enforcement. So he was field. ambitious. And I think that job hopping around was him... Yeah. Always wanting to make it to the next level, yeah. so that he could advance. And mm-hmm. and and when you don't have a college degree and you don't have an advanced degrees, you kind of just have to be scrappy. And he was scrappy, right? Yeah. And he was successful. And he was a hard worker. And, and he always did more than than required of him. Yeah, super was, hard worker, super yeah. successful. Yeah. And I remember ultimately he's working for Ford and Nixon, and he's hobnobbing with the presidents in back in D.C. So, I mean, he had a very successful career given where right. he came from. Yeah, and, and I wanted to continue. I wanted him to continue there, but he took a job. Uh, he started a business. He, yeah, he started Barter Systems. Yeah, started which, a bar, which I thought was just a disaster. So it was like an entrepreneurial thing where he wanted to start a new company, and he mm-hmm. cashed out his retirement in Dallas and, yeah, and, he, and became an entrepreneur. He used all of our savings to to have the barter barter business, and I, I never did a proof of it and barter barter systems was a it was a business based on an, a, a barter economy where he would sign up goods and services and it, it became a million dollar business in houston he had a, a big showroom and lots of salespeople and lots of employees it was kind of an you know a biggish deal back in houston in the day we had no cash we couldn't go down and buy a sandwich we were cash poor yeah we were cash poor we had all kinds but we had of a pinball stuff. machine <laughs> we had a pachinko machine and a Space Invaders tabletop game. We just didn't have. Uh, we we couldn't. Didn't always have groceries. So we were kind of middle class, though, right? How would you? By the time we're in Houston, what's our socioeconomic status? Middle class. Middle class, but kind of cash poor. Okay, so the divorce. How did it hit you? It was devastating. Because because of the children. What about you? Well, well, it was it was. I just think an adult. It's different for an adult than it is for a child. Adult is, you you do what you need to do, and what happens to you happens. But for children, I remember um, you you saying you saying to him one time, "Dad, some of my friends are getting a divorce." Uh, will ne- our family is never going to get a divorce, are they? And uh, he he assured you, because I remember he assured you that it, that could never happen in our family. Right. Yeah. And 
and it was it was devastating. The girls were like in college, and uh, but you but Joe was in high school and you were in junior high. Right. Uh-huh. Well, what did it do to the family? It was devastating for all of us. It was just things were never the same. They're never the same when something like that happens. And this was in the early 80s, 27 years into your marriage. Yeah. Um, again, Julie and Gina were in college. Joel and I were home. Mm-hmm. What was, and, and you said you blamed yourself. So that's, mm-hmm. that feels like a double whammy yeah. that not only are you losing, and none of your siblings yeah. ever got divorced. So it yeah, was just the, you. The worst thing that can happen in a marriage happens, and it's my fault. <laughs> And so what was that like to your self-esteem? Yeah, it's and, hard. Yeah. It's hard. So what were those years after the divorce like for you? Hard, but but it was a challenge and we and we met the challenge because during during those the, the, those times you speaking, you know, not necessarily speaking of all the others, every child was different. But for you, you you did some spectacular things during during those difficult times. So what? How do you remember that affecting me? Well, you you really put your nose to the grindstone. You you excelled in every way. Everything you tried to do, you excelled, and and you um, let's, let's get on the same page. Where where do you want to? No, that's good. So well, I, I I'm thinking about your um, well, I'm thinking about the period of time when you were in high school. Right. Okay. Let's go back. So you were going to tell that story about the primary program and families can be together forever and the divorce. Did you want to tell that story now? Well, it's not a story. It's just that whenever <clears throat> whenever I was playing the piano in primary, you were down there and you would watch me. And and when when the divorce happened, I hid my head so you couldn't see me. And I moved my head over and I was playing the piano like this so you couldn't see me. Because I couldn't face your gaze. Why? Because I felt so bad. You felt bad in what way? Felt bad about what? All the suffering. Right. Now where was I before <laughs> before we went back and we went back? So you're saying that my response oh, to the... oh your your response was you excelled. So what things do you remember me doing or getting into? Well, these aren't in order, but I remember you you being the student body president, and you did you went above and beyond. You you had a, a program where at graduation time you you had activities going all night long so kids wouldn't go out and get in trouble and be on the freeway and, and doing stuff. And you organized something that had never been done there, the Katie Ward before. And um uh, and the Katie School, I mean. And uh and you, you did positive things and you were well thought of. And uh You, you won teenager of the student of the year for the state of Texas. Yeah, and and you had lots of other awards and lots of other accomplishments <clears throat> at that time. And and when you went, and you carried it to college with you. And when you went to college, you you excelled, and you were on the dean's list for four years, and you. Um, excelled um, in 
in being a top student. And uh, I remember when you, you spoke at seminary graduation and you told the kids that, that uh, seminary was good because it made you unique because there weren't very many members of the church when you were going to seminary. There were a few, but not very many. And and you said it makes you it makes you unique and and it makes people trust you more. And and uh, you know you you you'd figured it out from from a student's point of view um, how valuable that that was. And uh, um, you said it tested you. No, it was just just really nice because you 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 had really um, taken the positive and during that period of time when our family was suffering so much, you 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 did hard things and you did them well and you were always a top student and and uh, <clears throat> a scholar and as well as socially you did well you were just you just excelled in every way you did sports played tennis basketball how did you perceive uh my church participation in high school how did i perceive it yeah what was i like with the church um i thought you were good i thought you were devoted and uh, and you were you were there and you were participating and you were positive in a positive way and uh, and and you you seemed to to be able to see down the line how it would help you how it would be beneficial the activity and the and the associations and the and the things that you learned you seem to to recognize that. How would you have described my testimony as a teen? Well, I think I think you had a testimony. You know, there's a testimony of the gospel and a testimony of the church. I think you had a testimony of the church that it was a good organization. But I I I think you were searching for spirituality. Because I remember you asking Don if he had ever had, you know, he was a bishop for 11 years, and I remember you asking him if he had ever had any spiritual experiences. And Don was, was not your typical person in the church having spiritual experiences. He was, he was just a worker and get the job done. He was he was kind of like you in that regard, and um, and he he said he hadn't had any <laughs> any spiritual experiences, but uh, <clears throat> I think at that time you were searching for for some of these because you had seminary teachers that were always telling telling you these stories about their spiritual experiences, and and you liked that I think, and that felt good to you, and it felt. And so you wondered if anyone close to you had had, had things like that happen. Right. And I don't think our family was spiritually inclined that way. To like miracles or manifestations. Yeah, yeah that kind of stuff. That's what you were looking for. You were looking for that with someone you respected and loved and someone that was close to you. Yeah, because I'd say you and Dad were very practical in your Mormonism. Yeah. You're very meat and potatoes, get the work done, yeah. serve, don't question, yeah. heads down, Mormons. And then I'd have Lawrence Layton and others, <laughs> you know, in seminary tell me about miracles and healings and spiritual manifestations. And that just wasn't a part of our family. Yeah. So I wanted to have those types of yeah. experiences, mm -hmm. but I, I couldn't have them. And so I was searching for that. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> 